You are now listening to Mark's Unexplained World by Mark the Medium from Hinkley Community Radio, a non-profit podcast radio station. Tonight's episode is about the Dudley Town Curse. In northwestern Connecticut, in the United States, there is an abandoned settlement known only as Dudley Town, which is located in a valley known as the Dark Entry Forest. It is best known today as a ghost town. Since the mid-1920s, the land occupied by the village has been maintained by a private land trust named the Dark Entry Forest Association, who have worked to reforest the area after decades of agricultural use which left it barren. As of today, all that is left of the original village are a few holes in the ground which lead to the old cellars of the long lost buildings. However, due to the rumours of paranormal activity that started back in the 1980s, the village site has been subjected to persistent trespassers and unwanted vandalism, and as a result, the owners have since closed the land and the site is now no longer open to the public. Greetings, Unexplainers. Thank you once again for using your spare time in a useful manner and tuning in to listen to another episode of Mark's Unexplained World. My name is Mark Hughes. I'm a psychic medium, a ufologist and a true crime buff. In this episode, I'm going to tell you the story about the abandoned area and surroundings that are known as the Dudley Town Curse. And now this week's necessary disclaimer. In this episode, I will be touching on children who have disappeared. So, as with all my shows, you listen at your own discretion. Also, all opinions and comments are strictly my own, but the facts still remain. Again, I also apologise if I pronounce anything incorrectly. Personally, I think it's the pressure of knowing that I've got at least two or three listeners every week that are hanging on to my every word. So, sit back with a tea or coffee, or in my case a beer, and let me entrance you with this week's episode. First, let's take a look at some of the history surrounding the area. Surprisingly enough, Dudley Town was never an actual town. It was more of a nickname. The name of Dudley Town was given to a portion of Cornwall, a town in Litchfield County, Connecticut, on an unknown date that included several members of the Dudley family. All the Dudleys can trace their heritage back to the Saxon named Dud, who held the title of Duke of Mercia and who died back in 725 AD. It was Dud's land that would eventually become the site of Dudley Castle, which is located in the west of England in the town of, you guessed it, Dudley. An old English word for land was lay, so the area itself was called Dud's Lay. Many centuries later, When the taking of a surname became necessary, some people took a name based on their occupation, such as Smith or Baker, and others took their surname based on the land that they came from, i.e. Dudley. The area that became known as Dudley Town in Litchfield County, Connecticut, was first settled back in the early 1740s by a Thomas Griffiths who 
bought a plot of land that would later be considered the first plot in Dudley Town. And so, soon, over time, other families also settled in the area. These include the Tanner family, the Joneses, the Pattersons, the Dibbles and the Porter family, to name but a few. As with every other part of this small portion of Cornwall in Connecticut, Dudley Town, over the generations, converted the forest land to farmland, with the local families all choosing to prepare and cultivate the land for crops. However, due to the area being located on top of a high hill, Dudley Town was not really an area suited for farming. So when more fertile and spacious land started to build up in the Midwest during the mid-19th century and the local iron industry gradually wound down, Cornwall's population started to decline. Dudley Town itself was located a few miles south of the Cornwall Bridge neighbourhood in, you guessed it, Cornwall. And on a quick interesting side note, the Cornwall Bridge neighbourhood is a consensus designated place, or a CDP, comprising of the hamlets of Cornwall Bridge and Calhoun Corners in the towns of Cornwall and Sharon, Litchfield County, Connecticut, in the United States. It is primarily in the southwest corner of the town of Cornwall, but it extends west across the Housatonic River into the town of Sharon in the northern part of the census designated place. US Route 7 runs the length of the CDP, following the east side of the Housatonic River and crossing it on the Cornwall Bridge in the northern part of the census designated place. Cornwall was first listed as a CDP prior to the 2020 census. Dudley Town was located in a valley known as the Dark Entry Forest due to the many shadows that were cast by the mountains surrounding the Dudley Town village and the access road to the abandoned area. Due to the town's abandonment and vandalism, over time there isn't much of the town that has survived today. At the start of the 20th century, many of the old farms in Cornwall, Connecticut were, sell were sold to New Yorkers, who were looking for a quieter and better life in the countryside. It just so happened that one of these areas included Dudley Town which has now been privately owned since 1924 by the Dark Entry Forest Association. And on another interesting side note, the Dark Entry Forest Association was incorporated in December 1924 with 41 shareholders. The work being done by the state was to establish public forests that helped inspire the creation of private woodland. In 1924, when the Mohawk and Housatonic State Forests were being created, a group of New Yorkers acquired 800 acres of farmland on Bald Mountain in Cornwall, with the aim and goals that included the promotion of forestation and the conservation of nature. The society began by planting 4,000 tree saplings, and so, by the summer of 1927, they had planted approximately 10,000 seedlings, with most of them being red pine. The Dark Entry Forest Association still continues its work to this present day. I'll be giving you some more interesting details regarding the Dark Entry Forest Association in part three of this show. In promoting the Land Trust to investors, a March 1924 prospectus for the Dark Entry Forest stated, and I quote, 
This society is planned to promote forestation, to run a wood mill, to promote conservation of bird, animal and wildflower life, and to afford a playground for you, your children and your children's children. Soon after the acquisition, the owners themselves planted thousands of trees. And during the 1930s, New York's Historical Society, or otherwise known as the Skid Reverian Club, spent their winter weekends skiing on trails they built in the area, and in the summers they canoed up and down the Housatonic River. And not only that, but horse riding camps were also set up on the site specifically for children. Today, the Dudley Town Village is now closed to the public and anyone found trespassing on the site is prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law by the Connecticut State Police along with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. After this first short break in part two we will look at some of the strange and unlucky phenomena that is said to have happened to some of the villagers who once lived there. This show is brought to you courtesy of Neil Packer and the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre. Find them online at www.hauntedresearchcentre.com or at 9211 Regent Street, Hinkley, LE 10 1AW. Open on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for guided tours of the haunted rooms at just £3 per person. Booking is essential at all times and over 16s only please unless accompanied by an adult. The haunted rooms are extremely haunted and paranormal activity could and has taken place at any time. Some areas and particular objects or items can be quite scary and unnerving. Membership is available for £25 to qualify for selective offers. And why not download the app available on both iOS and Android for only £3.99 to keep up to date with what is coming up at the centre. Sadly, as of today, the homes of Dudley Town, the once busy, bustling little village that rested in the picturesque surrounding mountains are long, long gone. However, it would appear that the ghosts and spirits of those who once lived and worked within the village still remain ever present. There are lots of tales from the area that include ghosts, spirits, demons, very strange phenomena and of course the obligatory curse. I mean, let's face it, you can't have a haunted place without a curse, can you? Yeah, right. According to all accounts, I find... I, I, sorry, I'll try that one again. According to all the accounts I could find, this curse had actually started back in England in the year 1510. Edmund Dudley, who was one of the patriarchs of the Dudley family, was sentenced to death and beheaded for being part of a plot to overthrow King Henry VIII. It is said that a curse was placed on the Dudley family due to Edmund Dudley's treasonous behaviour. The curse is as follows, and I quote, All of the Dudley descendants would be plagued by unrelenting horrors and death would hound them until every last one of the Dudley descendants were wiped from the face of the earth. Believers of this curse 
believe that all the members of the Dudley family began going through some seriously bad shit. Well, they didn't quite say it like that, but you get the general idea. From the very beginning, many weird deaths and strange phenomenon became quite a common theme at Dudley Town. Several residents of Dudley Town are also said to have gone insane, and quite a few people have just simply vanished and never ever seen from or heard from again. Two local women, a Mrs Greeley, or better known as Mary Shaney, and Harriet Clark, are said to have hung themselves in the Dudley Town in 1872, with Harriet Clark having reported she was seeing visions of demons prior to her death. Another one of the villagers, Abiel Dudley, lost his entire fortune, and with it he eventually lost his entire mind. Abiel Dudley was eventually made a ward of the town. However, in his final years of being unable to care for himself, he just ended up wandering around the village aimlessly mumbling incoherently to himself about, and I quote, strange creatures in the woods. Abiel Dudley eventually died back in 1799 at the ripe old age of 90, which was really pretty good going back then at a time when most people were considered lucky enough to live into their 30s and 40s. And also, don't forget that back then, cutting yourself on a sharp, rusty tool would have often, more often than not, mean a death sentence due to the poor hygiene and medical facilities at the time. Another villager, William Tanner, who was one of Abiel Dudley's closest neighbours, was also said to have lost his mind, even though he lived to the exceptional ripe old age of 104. Apparently, William Tanner was another one who would also talk about, and I quote, strange creatures that came out of the woods during the night. Whether these strange creatures were supernatural or paranormal are just the product of an insane mind no one knows. Apparently, the records that are still in existence from Dudley Town also tell of various other strange phenomena, including disappearances, strange illnesses, numerous cases of people going insane, and other and various other otherworldly reports happening in the area at night. Although I must point out here that most of the reports come from the villagers who were declared insane. After the Civil War in 1865, Dudley Town began to slowly die. So as a result, most of the remaining families simply packed up and moved away to start new lives elsewhere. The small village was then soon reclaimed by Mother Nature and became the homes of many small animals and birds. During the last few days of Dudley Town, one mysterious event did come to light, which was so mysterious, in fact, that even some hard-earned sceptics can't seem to debunk this odd occurrence and are unable to give a reasonable explanation for this event. It was in 1901 when the population of Dudley Town had dwindled down to just a few families. One of the remaining residents, John Patrick Brophy, decided to keep his family there even though nearly everyone else had left. This would prove to be a fatal mistake on his behalf as John Patrick Brophy then suffered some real bad luck which caused his entire life to change within a matter of a few short months. First, his wife died when unfortunately she was struck down with a sudden illness and then right after his wife's funeral his two children vanished into the forest never to be seen again. And then shortly after his children had disappeared 
John Patrick Brophy's house burnt down to the ground in a mysterious fire and then to add insult to injury and not long after the fire John Patrick Brophy himself disappeared and was also never seen again. Some people just can't catch a break. So very shortly after this string of strange and unlucky occurrences happened to John Patrick Brophy, Dudley Town officially ceased to be. As time went by in the 1940s, there were many tales of ghostly lights, misty apparitions and other strange occurrences that all appeared when visitors to the old ruins reported seeing strange things. After this second short break in the final part of this case, we will look at a few more strange occurrences and the condition of Dudley Town today. Fright Nights was established in 1999 as the first company in the world to offer overnight ghost hunt experiences to the general public, pioneering paranormal events since the last century. Fright Nights operate at hundreds of the UK's most haunted and exclusive venues. All events have their own team of experienced paranormal investigators, mediums and psychics. They have a VIP members club for regular returning guests, offering loyalty discounts and exclusive invitation only events. They can also host private events for your family and friends. You can contact them on 07 852 998 628 or email them at office at frightnights.co.uk or take a look at their website at www.frightnights.co.uk where you can see the many locations they investigate and learn about them and the opportunities they have available. Hundreds of ghost hunters join Fright Nights every month for the most thrilling ghost hunting experiences they'll never forget. If you haven't been on a ghost hunt before, then why not join them to see what it's all about? Why not visit their social media sites for up-to-date information on all the places they visit and to see what's coming up in the future. They look forward to seeing you all soon. Fright Nights goes hunting events. Remember, only the original will do. After the death of the last Dudley Town resident, a gentleman known only as Dr. Clark purchased a large plot of land in the area and became the official owner of Dudley Town, or at least what was left of the abandoned village anyway. It is claimed that Dr. Clark left his wife at home for a few days and when he returned, he found that to his complete surprise she had gone completely insane. And one of the things that gave some clarification to her insanity was the continual screaming about the creatures in the woods, which eventually led her to commit suicide in her own home. A few years after his first wife had died, Dr. Clark remarried and then built a new home in Dudley Town for himself and his new bride. Unfortunately, I can't seem to find the names to either of his wives anywhere. And this is where part two of the interesting side note about the Dark Entry Forest Association comes in. Together, Dr. Clark and his second wife, along with a group of their friends, formed the Dark Entry Forest Association. What with the trees and forests being destroyed across the country, the association hoped to at least preserve the land. Sadly though, Dr. Clark 
and his second wife died during the 1940s. However, their descendants still live around the abandoned area that was once Dudley Town. Since the 1990s, the police in Cornwall, Connecticut, have responded to numerous calls about cases of vandalism in the area. Due to the 1999 movie, The Blair Witch Project, which was about a haunted forest, it prompted increased interest in the allegedly haunted village. Due to this increase in vandalism, the owners of the Dudley Town properties finally closed what was left of the village to the public. On an interesting side note, the Blair Witch Project is a 1999 American supernatural horror film written and directed by Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez. It is a fictional story of three student film na makers named Heather Donoghue, Michael C. Williams and Joshua Leonard, who hike into the Black Hills, hills near Burksville, Maryland in 1994 to film a documentary about a local myth known as the Blair Witch. The three filmmakers disappear, but their equipment and footage are discovered a year later. The purportedly found footage is the movie the viewers see. The movie grossed nearly $250 million worldwide, making it one of the most successful independent films of all time. The Reverend Gary P. Dudley, a Texas resident and author of the 2001 book, The Legend of Dudley Town, Solving Legends Through Genealogical and Historical Research, disputes these accounts of the troubled town. In tracing the genealogy of his name, he found virtually no historical basis for the Dudley Town curse, no genealogical link to the name Edmund Dudley, no mysterious illnesses or deaths, and as for Mary Shaney, who was said to have hung herself, he says she had never set foot in Dudley Town. These days, the land is owned by the Dark Entry Forest Association, and entry into Dudley Town is no longer permitted. Every year, usually around the Halloween month of October, the Cornwall Historical Society receives many requests, particularly from paranormal investigators, to visit Dudley Town. But the answer is always a resounding no. One of the reasons for this is that the Cornwall Historical Society does not have the right to grant permission. The area of Cornwall, Connecticut, popularly known as Dudley Town, is private property. Another reason being, and personally I think this is a good reason, the people who live in Dudley Town are completely fed up with thrill-seeking would-be ghost hunters. I mean, do you really want total strangers wandering around your yard or garden, peering through your windows, setting fires and leaving litter and invading your privacy? No, you wouldn't. No one would. There is a clear warning sign from the Connecticut State Police that clearly states, and I quote, Those who go or attempt to go to Dudley Town will be arrested for trespassing and or parking. The fines start at $75 per person and increases rapidly in huge increments. Today, some people who have made the long trek to visit the outskirts of the areas that are still open to the public show photographs of strange mists that appear to show creepy faces peering out at the observer. Some people have said that they get feelings of terror, see mysterious lights and hear creepy sounds as they get close. And many people have also reported that they have experienced being touched or pushed and scratched by unseen hands. Many folks say that this area was once land that belonged to the Mohawk tribe and that they and that they left it when the ground became soured or cursed. And on a last interesting side note for this episode of Mark's Unexplained World, the Mohawk tribe or people 
on the most easterly section of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy. They are on a Iroquoian speaking indigenous people of North America with communities in both southeastern Canada and northern New York State. As one of the five original members of the Iraq League, Iroquois League, sorry, Iroquois, <laughs> Iroquois League, they are known as the Keepers of the Eastern Door and the traditional guardians of the Iroquois Confederation against invasions from the East. But whatever the reasons for the strange and ghostly phenomena in the area once known as Dudley Town, there is one thing you can always guarantee. And that is that this remote part of Connecticut will always remain a favourite place for paranormal investigators for many years to come. Thank you all for taking the time out to listen to this episode of Mark's Unexplained World. On our next episode, show 62, we are going to be looking at Mel's Hole, the mysterious infinite pit. The legend of the bottomless hole started on the 21st of February in 1997. When a man, identifying himself as Mel Waters, appeared as a guest on Coast to Coast AM radio with Art Bell. Walters claimed that he owned rural property nine miles west of Ellingsburg in Kittitas County, Washington, that contained a mysterious hole. According to Walters, the hole had an unknown depth. He claimed to have tried measuring its depth using fishing line and a weight although he had still not hit the bottom by the time 80,000 feet of line had been used. He also claimed that his neighbour's dead dog had been seen alive sometime after it was thrown into the hole. According to Waters, the hole's magical properties prompted US federal agents to seize the land and fund his relocation to Australia. This show was written and researched by myself, Mark Hughes, and proofread and edited by Linda Hughes. The actors in this episode were Mark Hughes, Linda Hughes and Denise Pula. With special thanks to Neil Packer and the staff at the Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre in Hinckley, and a big thanks to everyone for listening. Mark's Unexplained World, because there's more to the paranormal than meets the third eye. And remember guys, keep it real, because being real is better than being perfect. This show and all its contents are covered by basic copyright of Mark the Medium. <laughs>